Good morning and welcome to the Maine Department of Education's Medication Administration in Maine Schools Overview. My name is Lori Hewitt. I am a school nurse regional liaison for the Department of Education. Our state is broken into four different regions with each of them having a liaison to uh, provide you with direct support and connect education with health programs. Most of you are new to school nursing and will find that giving medications in the school setting feels quite different than how it felt to give medications in a hospital setting. Some of you may have been nursing in the school setting for quite some time, but you're already ready for some updated resources. Our objectives today are to introduce uh, the revised Chapter 40 rule, explore updated evidence-based medication guidelines, identify your role as the school nurse in training, coordinating, and overseeing unlicensed school personnel, which will be referred to as USP throughout this presentation, and practice applying the decision tree for coordination and oversight, all while encouraging collaboration, safe culture, leadership, and autonomy. Students are in school with you between six and seven hours a day. You're the hub, you're an invaluable resource for families, for teachers, and for healthcare providers. All of the support and assessments that you provide during the school day are essential for keeping our students in school. Children will receive medications in school for many reasons. It may be chronic conditions, such as diabetes or asthma, acute needs, like finishing up a, um, a course of antibiotics or having a headache, or life-saving medications, such as um, epinephrine, glucagon. Your role is huge um, when giving medications, but uh, the meat and potatoes of your role is the most valuable lesson that we learned in nursing school, which is you do not have to know everything all of the time, but you have to know where to find your resources. And we're going to help you with that. Um, provide You're going to provide training, direction, coordination, and oversight. You will clarify and decline any medication that you believe to jeopardize the safety of a student, and you're going to help your district create procedures and protocols or update them. Here are three very important resources that you will use. Chapter 31 shares what your scope is and what the scope is for other nursing licenses. It outlines what you can do and what and who you can delegate to. Chapter six is a rundown of what, who, and how related to coordination and oversight. And 40 is, um, that is a link that'll bring you to the Department of Education rules. You'll look for chapter 40. Uh, rules fill in the gaps or they in, otherwise know interpreting legislation. And chapter 40 is a rule specific to administering medications in school. Chapter 40 has recently been updated. It was updated in May of 2022. It's broken into seven sections that you can see here on the screen. Um, the link to Chapter 40 you can also find on our website. It's an easy, another easy way to access it. We encourage you to reference it normally. Chapter 40 talks about administering medications in the school setting, the required training that needs to be given to USPs, procedures for school field trips and off-campus activities, epinephrine and naloxone guidelines, and reporting. Your district likely has policies and procedures in place. They need to have those, but you should be involved in all of the updates and if they don't have them in the creation. The following procedures and protocols are, they must be developed for local development, such as the transportation of medications to and from school, medication administration on field trips or off-campus activities, accountability and proper storage of medications, allergy, anaphylaxis, and emergency training, the procedure to use should a medication reaction occur, 
access to medication in a disaster, documentation, medication errors, and proper disposal of medications. You could also consider developing proper disposal of sharps and special considerations such as homeopathy, marijuana. Family engagement, that's building relationships and identifying the needs of your students and families, celebrating cultures, different cultures, while exploring your own biases and beliefs in theirs and validating their experiences. As a school nurse, it's imperative that you engage the family when caring for the health needs of your students. The medication guide is loaded with valuable printable resources that you can share with your USPs while you're training. It's broken into sections. And here's the first seven sections. Laws, schools, policies, resources, basic routes, basic classifications, common medications and their side effects, how to read a label, how to document, how to document errors, the rights of medication administration, procedures and protocols for administering, signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis or adverse effects, responding to emergencies, and working with parents protecting confidentiality. You'll also find on our website fillable forms for you to download and customize. Please remember that it's not mandatory that you use any of the forms that we've provided, which you can either print or download and use electronically. But we know that sometimes it's easiest not to recreate the wheel in a busy health office. You can, you, if you'd like, you can look at our forms as an example and um, build your own. Applying the rights of medication administration can feel different and um, might be a little hard and clunky to get started with when you're working in the school setting. This is a nice little visual that we do um, supply. You can, you'll find it on our website for a little poster that you can put on the front of your medication cabinet. Um, it can help um, your USPs when you're training them as well and can be a nice reminder for your substitutes. The right student, um, you know, like I said, without a name tag to scan, you know, you're asking their name and date of birth, but also it's um, not a bad idea and you could consider putting a picture of the student, maybe last year's picture, on the bottle top and on the authorization form or your, your MAR and for comparing. It's a nice safety net for you and also for your substitute or your USP that's um, in your absence taking care of the student. The right medication um, also can be tricky because you have one cabinet with everybody's medications on them. You could consider putting them in the order that they're administered throughout the day. The right dose, um, when thinking about that, you may have five milligram pills and the student might come in in the morning and need five milligrams, but at lunch they only need two and a half milligrams. Um, so you'll need to cut pills. Uh, when things like that happen, the, there could be highlighted on your administration record, um, highlighted on your bottle. Uh, maybe you could cut some pills ahead of time. And the right time is within 30 minutes of when it was ordered, the right route, and uh, documentation. Document in real time. Read the label three times every time. You're going to do that and you're going to teach it. Uh, you're going to, before you take the medication off the shelf, you're going to read the label before you give it to the student and then again before you return it to the sh shelf. That label is, uh, you, is in something we just found on the internet. You can use any label. It is in our guidelines. Um, consider printing it or another label and um, you can use that to quiz your USPs, help them find the rights. Accountability for medications and counting medications. Controlled medications such as stimulants, which you will most likely be giving in school, must be counted upon receipt with a perpetual daily log that's maintained on the student's medication record. What that perpetual log looks like is up to you. 
Um, NASN does have a nice medication inventory record that you can use as a model or you can use, um, but really it's um, up to you how you do that. Part of the responsibility of the school nurse is to evaluate the competence of those that he or she has selected to administer medications in their absence. The nurse's responsibility in oversight is to identify the needs of the student and the tasks that are to be performed. Provide direction to your USP on how to perform those tasks while determining their ability, continuing to monitor and evaluate their performance on um, that task. This is the um, decision tree that you'll find on our website as well. You'll find a link as well in our medication guidelines, um, but we're gonna uh, practice and go through how to use that. First step is, is the task within the registered nurse's scope of practice? Well, I guess uh, first we'll think of what kind of tasks would not be in the scope of practice. And we have nursing diagnoses, but we don't diagnose conditions. You know, we don't uh, suture students. And the next, the next step, so we've decided it is within our scope of practice. The next step is, are there any specific laws, rules, or institutional agency policies prohibiting coordination and oversight? And you'll find that information in chapter 46 and 31. And you'll also need to know your district policy. So we know that we're able to, next is, can the task be performed without observation or critical decision making that requires nursing judgment, knowledge, and skills? This is a big one. Um, uh, a big question that comes up often is whether or not the school secretary, who is your USP that you have trained, can give Tylenol for a headache. So there's decisions to be made and there's assessment, you know. Is it just a headache? Do they have a sore throat as well? Could this be strep? Um, does this particular student avoid class on a regular basis and come down at this time of day? Um, is it COVID? There's an assessment required. That's not to say that the nurse can't be consulted from wherever she is, but that, you know, there's your, there's your nursing. The next question is, can this task be safely performed according to clear, unchanging directions? There are yeses and noes to this question. A, a yes, clear, unchanged is a child that takes Focalin every day at lunch. All of the orders are in place. You have authorization from the parents and you have authorization from the physician. They've been on Focalin for quite some time. You give them their dose before lunch. You can coordinate and oversee that. But you might not be able to, um, like the example previous with a headache, that's not clear and unchanging. A student that's never had a medication before, or uh, maybe a student has seizure disorder and has never you know, been treated with diastat. So we have clear, okay, so we, we have clear and you know, changing. The next question is, are there reasonably predictable outcomes of taking this medication? Yes, for the schedule of medication, or yes, for following a diabetic uh, care map, when a blood sugar's in range and you're just covering the lunch carbs, or even an anaphylactic reaction for a known allergy with a prescribed epinephrine pen. That is reasonably, reasonably predictable. But no is, like we said before, maybe diastat for a student who's never had diastat. He's never had a seizure in school. Or if the diabetic comes um, before, you know, 15 minutes before lunch, right after gym with uh, blood sugar in the 50s and a fever. It's not very predictable what's happening next, right? Responding to emergencies in a school setting. 
Appropriate staff must be trained on the administration of emergency medications, such as epinephrine. But this is a time that we can talk about a collaborative practice agreement, and I can explain what a collaborative practice agreement is. We have samples of collaborative practice agreements on our website. A collaborative practice agreement, if signed, allows any trained individual in a school setting to administer epinephrine not only to those that have diagnosed anaphylaxis and prescribed epinephrine, but it allows those unlicensed trained personnel to administer epinephrine to a suspected anaphylactic reaction with a stock dose of epinephrine. If you do not have a collaborative practice agreement, the only individual in the building that can administer epinephrine to a suspected anaphylactic reaction would be a registered nurse that has a standing order for epinephrine to be administered with stock epinephrine. These are the guidance principles that we've placed in the medication guidance document, but you most certainly may direct your USP to contact you for more reasons than those that are listed here. We've listed whenever a new medication is received, the first dose of a new medication or a change in an order, whenever a parent calls with directions to administer differently than ordered. Any medication label that doesn't match, if it doesn't appear correct, a student refuses a medication, an adverse side effect is recognized, or of course if a medication error has been made, and always whenever your USP is uncertain. Medication errors. We need to talk about them. We need to build safe cultures in our schools. This medication error poster can be printed and uh, placed on your med cabinet or in your room because when you're in a situation where an error happens, it can feel a little bit panicky and in a school setting especially. Um, so having something like this will help slow down and help somebody in a, in a situation that this happens. The more we talk about our errors and our near misses, the more we're gonna foster a safe environment and keep our kids safe, our students safe. But let's talk a little bit about what's not considered a medication error. So a refused medication, when a student can't tolerate a medication or maybe a dropped medication on the floor, those are wasted medications, that's not an error. A lack of a medication supply is not a medication error. And a parent's request to hold a medication is not an error. Can a student possess sunscreen without a physician's order in school? This is new. Um, uh, last year it was new, but yes, yes a student can in school now. It must be in the original container. There must be directions for use and warnings, and you must have written parental uh, permission. So there is no expectation that the school will ever supply sunscreen to students or that the school will apply to students. But if a student is unable to self-apply, school personnel may assist under certain circumstances, such as the student requests help, the parent or guardian um, gives permission, and the school authorizes that individual to apply it. The self-administering of medications. In addition to the specific medications listed in Chapter 40, if the individual health care plan of a student determines that a specific medication is needed for self-carry, the school nurse may allow it if three conditions are met. There's written approval. The student has an IHP or an individualized health care plan that requires the student to self-carry and the student demonstrates the ability to administer to the school nurse and the responsibility. Medical marijuana. Reasonable accommodations must be made for students who hold written certification for the medical use of non-smokable marijuana. 
but it may only be possessed and administered under the following conditions. A dose is required during the school day. It is possessed by the parent or guardian or caregiver only, and only if the parent or guardian and only the parent or guardian may administer medical marijuana. You won't have it in school. A school employee may not administer. The transportation and storing of medication on field trips will comply with any special directions and will be secured as safely as possible. Those medications will be in a duplicate pharmacy bottle. There is a new section in this document that considers, considers enteral tube feedings. Um, when you're giving medications via enteral tube, you can use the guidelines such as the six rights that you use for um, medications. Homeopathic medication. Registered nurses can administer medications that are prescribed by a provider if it's within their scope of practice to prescribe such medication. In a school, the school nurse and administrator in consultation with the family and the school health advisor will determine if this medication is appropriate to be administered in school. And if it is, the prescriber will furnish a complete written order. Medication administration to boarding students living on a campus in a dormitory are consistent with the guidance found throughout this document. There are some extra considerations, however. The dormitory director may also have proper storage for medications given outside of school hours. Unidentifiable medications require collaboration with the school health advisor. The school nurse will provide directions in the host family's native language when the school leaves, the student leaves campus. And when medication is refused outside of school hours, the school nurse will be contacted. Youth experiencing homelessness. A minor may give consent to all medical, mental, dental, and other health counseling and services if the minor is living separately from the parents or legal guardians and is independent of parental support. For more information um, about McKinney Vento in Maine, we have linked a site there, but you can also find it on the DOA's website.